Uh, my name is Jim Nelson, and uh, I'm going to be talking about a parser game that I wrote for the interactive fiction competition last year called According to Kane. And I want to talk about the history of its development and um, specifically uh, some of the, um, uh, the challenges that I had to overcome to convert it into a, a parser game. Okay. So let me start with, with, with who I am, Jim Nelson. Uh, I'm a software engineer at the Internet Archive. Uh, I've been programming for I don't know how long now. Um, I've been playing video games since the 1970s. It was, it's just, uh, to me, it's just a part of, of who I am. Um, it's, there's, um, uh, I don't remember a time when I wasn't playing video games. Um, my first introduction to interactive fiction was actually uh, by way of Advent or Colossal Caves. Um, I grew up in a town with a nuclear weapons research facility. And so my friend's fathers had access to machines that I couldn't get at home. And uh, it was, I, was at, I was there at the lab and my friend's father, I just said, do you have any video games to play? And he showed me this game, which was all text. And I'd never seen a video game that was just text. And he showed me how to take lamp and move through the door, and then I was hooked. I was like, this is what I want to keep playing. Um, I was also one of those kids that got into the Choose Your Own Adventure games back then, too. Or books, I should say. Um, however, I have a degree in English literature and an MFA in creative writing. And so uh, for the last 25 years or so, I've been seriously writing traditional fiction, not interactive fiction. And... What I have here are some covers from my books. This is a, uh, a series of books. It's a multi-generational family saga that takes place in an alternate universe. Um, it's very similar to our culture, but there's a, a biological difference. Um, I won't go into that. Um, these are also some other books I've written, which include uh, a cyberpunk thriller. Uh, and the middle is my latest book, which is a retelling of the Hound of the Baskervilles from the perspective of the villain. Um, I, I only show these covers to get, make the point that this is where my head has been at creatively for a long time. And um, so writing according to Kane was in some ways, uh, mm -hmm. some of it came very natural, but some of it was not where my head has been. And um, going through this process, I learned a lot about telling stories and interactivity, and uh, I just wanted to share that. So this is the, the description that I gave in the, uh, the summary, which is, I'll discuss the formative ideas that led to developing the parser game according to Kane, the problems of writing a religious mystery game from a secular perspective, using graphics and music in a parser-based game, and the restriction I placed on myself, uh, and the restrictions I found myself faced with. Um, but that's all true, but really, I just want to discuss how a traditional story became an interactive fiction. And that's really what uh, is uh, the, the bulk of my, my talk will be. Um, I'm also hoping that you might get out of this the inspiration to finish a game that you've been thinking about, or perhaps the confidence to develop something you were uncertain about, um, or just some fresh ideas to fuel your creativity. Um, yeah. So here's sort of the tale of the tape. Um, According to Kane is a parser-based interactive fiction. It was coded in about one year between October 2021 and September 2022. It's written in TADS 3. If you're not familiar with TADS, that's a system much like in form for producing text-based adventures. Um, it was a, it's approximately 17,000 lines of code at the end of the day, um, I submitted it to the, I, uh, the IFConf 2022, um, did reasonably well. I'm pretty proud of what happened. Uh, and it also won some uh, IFDB awards earlier this year, including uh, the player's choice for the outstanding game of the year. And um, that was also very flattering. So where did this all start? Well, it actually started well over 10 years ago, maybe even close to 12. Um, I had this idea for writing a short story uh, about Cain and Abel 
from Kane's point of view. Um, I'll be talking more about the, the basic story about in a moment. But specifically, I didn't want to write a modernized version of it, or like a, a science fiction version, uh, for example. But I actually wanted to tell the story as the literal Genesis story, like the Adam and Eve, and Abel and Cain living in that time period, um, but from, told from a humanistic point of view. Um, my first stabs at this were as a short story. I later tried to expand it to a novella. Um, the scenes were written in a haphazard order. It was meant to be like small bursts of prose um, broken up over the pages. There was never any really like a beginning or a middle or an end in my, my structure. It was meant to be the kind of story where you're reading these scenes and that the reader has to sort of piece together from them what the actual, what the overall story was. And the idea was that these scenes were being, were almost like as if Cain was keeping a journal or a diary. And that's why it's called According to Cain. Um, and I, I wound up doing, like I said, this took many years. I, it was something, it was, a, it was a kind of a project that I would jump into, I would write for a while, and then I would grow dissatisfied with it and move away. And then a year or two later, I would jump back into it saying, oh, I think I got this now. And again, maybe uh, after a little bit of time, I, I'd, grow, um, I'd grow tired of it and move on. Um, but in between all of that, I was, running, I was doing quite a bit of research for this. And uh, I was looking for inspiration on ways to tell the story and different scenes and moments and such. Um, the book of Genesis was my master narrative. That's the basic story. That's the story of Adam and Eve. That's the give birth to Cain and Abel. Um, Cain kills Abel. Um, and, and that, I decided, was going to be the, the framework for my story. And the reason I say that is that there are, others, there are other alternate tellings of the Cain and Abel story in other religions and other traditions. And while I drew from those other texts, uh, I, I decided I wasn't going to stay true to, to any of the other ones. Um, Cain and Abel is mentioned in the Quran. Uh, it's also in the Latter-day Saints' Pearl of Great Price. Uh, actually, it's, that's quite a, quite a fleshed out story. It's a very different story than the, uh, than the one in the, in the Book of Genesis. And then there's these extra canonical texts, um, religious texts that have been handed down, but were not actually part of the canonical Bible. Um, including the Targum Jerusalem, the Book of Jubilees, which is sometimes called Little Genesis, as it's another telling of the Genesis stories. Um, there was the Cave of Treasures and then the Book of Adam and Eve. And it was really interesting. Um, these other texts uh, did try to flesh out the Adam and Eve story and Cain and Abel as well. And the reason I highlighted Targum Jerusalem is that that was the one that I found most compelling outside of the Book of Genesis. Uh, it's specifically because in the Targum Jerusalem, Cain and Abel have like a theological debate about the nature of good and evil. And, and I sort of grabbed quite a bit of that and refashioned it for my own, my own purposes. But even with all this research and all these years of working on it, I just never could finish the story. I could never find its emotional center. And so I, I wound up just putting it aside. So I, I, I assume that most people here know about the story of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, but just in case someone doesn't, I'm going to just go quickly over it. Um, Adam and Eve are the first two people created by God, and he places them in the paradise Eden, uh, where they're expelled from committing a sin. Uh, Adam and Eve live in the wilderness. They suffer deprivation and pain and, and suffering. They uh, raise Cain and Abel, two brothers, as well as daughters that are not mentioned in most of the, the narratives. Um, Cain works the field, and Abel raises the livestock. They both give an offering to God, um, but the offering is Cain's offering is rejected, uh, while Abel's offering is accepted. And the details of that are murky in most of the narratives. It's just it's just sort of known that one offering was accepted and one was rejected. At that point, Cain kills Abel, which is the first recorded murder in the Bible. Um, and it's also the first death in the Bible, interestingly enough, the human death, I should say. And, and that's what's another 
compelling aspect of the story. And for that, Cain is punished to wander the earth for the rest of his days. Um, it's a very stark story. Um, uh, downstairs during lunch, we were talking about the concept of restorative justice. That this is not restorative justice. This is this is absolute justice. This is, no, yeah, you, you need to pay a price for this. Um, and Cain and Abel, this story resonates uh, across a variety of media and, and um, authors. Steinbeck's East of Eden is about two brothers at war. Byron wrote a play about Cain. That's actually a very interesting text itself. Uh, James Baldwin wrote Sonny's Blues, his famous short story. Um, even, even the myth of Remus and Romulus, which is about the founding of Rome, is about brothers fighting over the founding of that city. I, I don't know that Remus and Romulus was directly inspired by Abel and Cain. But my point is, is that the idea of brothers fighting uh, is just is, is something that seems to resonate across these different cultures. Um, even in Star Trek, the, the founding of the Klingon Empire is based on a, a, a fictional origin story of two brothers fighting beside a river. And that's what kind of compelled me with this. That's what kept me going, that I wanted to um, keep at this story, but I could not find a way into it. And the point is, is that I never set out to write like a religious story or a religious game. I wasn't trying to enforce a particular um, notion of, of how someone should act or who, sh who you should pray to or anything. I wanted to reinterpret a myth. That was my intention. And to find, as I say here, I wanted to find within that myth my own truth. But what did I find compelling and interesting about that? And then convey that to my audience. So it was during the pandemic, like most of us, I was locked inside and going kind of crazy. And uh, it occurred to me that it just was a wild idea. So what if I could convert this into a parser game? I always wanted to write a parser game. And I had dabbled with tads for on and off over 20, 25 years now. And had never had enough oomph to get across the finish line. So that's when I became inspired, but my first problem was, who does the character play in this story? And my first thought was they could play Cain, but I just was not willing to write a game where you have to type kill Abel at some point. I just, I felt that was too much of an ask. And, and, and of course, it's, it's, a, it's a, this is interactive fiction, so you can say, well, I don't want to kill Abel. And that's kind of the point of the story. So I, I wasn't sure if I was willing to go that. If someone wants to write that game, by the way, I'm, I would be happy to help them or give them some advice, but that's just not the game I wanted to write. So it occurred to me that Abel was murdered. So what if it was a mystery story? Um, what if there's like a detective that is sent back to solve some kind of mystery associated with this? And when I was thinking about it, I was thinking, would it be like a modern detective or a detective from history? And it was thinking about the name of the rose uh, it sort of inspired me to make the detective like a monk or a, a member of a religious order. Um, so someone from the Middle Ages or the Renaissance, pre-Renaissance perhaps, um, who actually goes back to, to see the events and to answer some question related to the story of Cain and Abel. And when I say inspired me, I don't want to lean too heavily on Don Bedrock. I'm not trying to steal his, his, his greatness. Uh, but just, it gave me some confidence that it wasn't such a wild idea. Like if, if you've not read or seen the movie, it's, it's brilliant. And that is also, it's a, it's a murder mystery with a, a monk who's a detective, but he's, it's so much more. Um, but yeah, like I said, it just gave me the confidence to, to, to follow through on that. Um, this, it's interesting. I just came from the, the, the detective and mystery uh, talk downstairs about an ace attorney and yeah what what is it clara was saying was i it was dead on i, I all of that resonates with me the, the, a couple of things i would add though is that i think mystery and detective stories especially are kind of an interesting way to tell a story um the detective is an outsider looking into a crime usually the detective is not intimately involved with the people uh, or the crime itself they're they're a sort of meant to be like a neutral third party. Well, maybe not neutral, but definitely a third party. Um, detectives can also uh, stir the drink, get things moving again. 
Um, quite often in detective fiction, people will tell the detective, you know, go away, get out of here. This isn't your business. How much do I have to pay you off to make you, to make you stop investigating this? And the idea is the detective won't do that. They're going to continue to stir, to bring up these old secrets, old injustices to, to tell and ultimately tell the story. And in that light, I was thinking a lot of, um, when I was working on this, is Ross McDonald, who was an author mid-century, um, 19, uh, the 20th century, uh, who wrote these private eye stories set in Los Angeles. Uh, his stories were largely family dramas, though. They, often the detective was actually digging up old family secrets. Um, in the case of the moving target, it's a millionaire and his family. Uh, the Galton case is actually a multi-generational family genre uh, where, going, where it's set in the 1950s or the early 60s, but he has to go and dig up old details from the 1920s, for example. But as much as I like this idea of, of, of this being a, like a mystery story, there's a big problem. Everybody knows who killed Abel. That's not a, a, it's not a big secret. And I, I thought, okay, that's, this is even like a dead end once again. But there were two, there's two mysteries associated with Abel and Cain that aren't exactly like traditional mystery questions. The first is, is the mark of Cain. This is a, an element told in the book of Genesis and some of these other extra canonical texts, excuse me. <clears throat> And the mark of Cain is a, uh, when God punishes Cain, uh, he places a mark on him that he will carry the rest of his life that warn others that Cain killed Abel. It's never explained what the mark is, though. And there was a lot of speculation about this. Um, and some of it, uh, not, I'm not going to discuss, but the, it's, that's one of the mysteries. There's an entire Wikipedia entry on this question. And so I came to this idea of like, what if these academics from the Middle Ages, they need to know this, like the truth, there's never enough truth in this world. We need to know what happened. So what if the player is sent back to determine the mark of Cain? Which means that the game isn't about solving the crime, it's about solving the punishment. Like what happened to Cain? Um, also in the book of Genesis, once this happens, you're not, you don't hear of Cain again. He's just, he, he's sort of written out of the book. Um, some of these extra canonical texts do talk about Cain and the rest of his life. Um, but, uh, and, and those, again, I drew inspiration from without, without healing exactly to them. But there's also a second mystery, which is, why does Cain kill Abel? Uh, it's, most people forget about this. Uh, they think that it's jealousy, that God accepted Abel's offering, but not Cain's, and so that sort of answers the question. But I thought, again, there's probably more there to the story than we think. And I wanted to write into these holes in this, this, uh, this story. I should also mention that the book of Genesis, where it talks about Abel and Cain, it's about the total story, something like 20 or 25 sentences, this entire Brother, brotherly rivalry, brother rivalry, and the offering and the murder and the punishment. It's, it's not very long. It's very sparsely told. So all those holes were there for me to fill and to add with my imagination. And this is the title card of the game, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. And these four quotes um, sort of are an indication of the research I had done and my perspective on the, on the story. And I came up with these quotes, or I didn't come up with them, but I landed on these quotes as very early on in the writing process, long before I wanted to write a parser game. Um, and because I felt like these four quotes um, sort of summarize what I wanted to write about. Um, and if you notice, they come from these different sources. Uh, the King James Version of Genesis, the Quran, uh, the Latter-day Saints, uh, Pearl of Great Price, and then back to Genesis. And um, it's that last line that most fascinated me. And Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And that, I felt, was somewhat close to the emotional core of the story that I was, I was trying to seek. 
So now I'm going to talk about the interactivity. Like once I landed on this idea of turning this bare bones idea for a story into a parser game, how could I make it more interactive? I, I was really, really afraid of just steamrolling the player mm -hmm. through my story, just presenting them lots of text and they're just kind of hitting space to get through it. And so now that I had this detective motif, I thought maybe that's, maybe I can play with that some more. And one of the earliest ideas I came up with was, I came up with this, this notion that most of these parser games that I really admired have what I call a device. I, I don't really have a, a good formal definition for it, but what I noticed is, is that a lot of these games that I've, I've come to like as parser games have this unique mechanism that is organic and particular to the game. Um, Enchanter, the old Infocom game, has a spell system, this, this beautiful spell system that everybody, everybody remembers and loves. Um, two years ago, I think it was the Interactive Fiction Conf in 2021, Amanda Walker's What Heart Heard of Ghost Guts had this beautiful uh, device of using emotions to create actions in the world. Um, and then uh, Andrew Pock and Spider and Web had that wonderful toolkit that you have uh, during the various uh, sequences in the game. So my idea was, was this is a medieval detective, so what if he has like an alchemy system to work on? And my mind immediately jumped to the four humors, which I'll discuss in a moment. And so I came with this idea of what if you gather substances, you have and gather substances, and you mix the substances together on the surfaces of, of the game, and that can produce various effects that somehow help you solve puzzles, reveal clues, and that kind of thing. And it, it was sort of, this idea worked out really well, because it, it was kind of like a, a device created its own gravy, so to speak. Um, it instantly created opportunities for new puzzles, collecting various substances that you need to fulfill these mixtures learning what the mixtures are. You can't just randomly throw three or four of these substances together and get something. It'll just fizzle out. You have to know the recipes, and you don't know the recipes up front. You have to learn the recipes as you go. Um, but something kind of really interesting happened with this alchemy system, and it wound up tying directly into the four characters that are the center of this game. Um, so to go back to the four humors, this was interesting to study into itself. I thought I knew about the four humors until I started researching it, and I realized I didn't know as much about them as I did. But the basic idea is, is for quite a long time into antiquity, there was this idea that there were various fluids in the human body, and that there were four main ones. And if you had too much of one or not enough of one, it would affect your mood, your disposition, how you acted, and so forth. Um, and these are the four, the four canonical humors. These are sort of the ones that most people landed on, uh, most cultures landed on, I should say. Um, there was yellow bile, which gave you a choleric nature. Uh, black bile made you melancholic. Phlegm made you phlegmatic. And blood made you, I'm going to mispronounce this word, sanguine. Yeah, sanguine. So uh, the idea is if you have too much yellow bile, you're, you're desperate, you're obsessive. Too much black bile you're nostalgic or depressive, too much phlegm, and by the way, that's not like phlegm when you have a cold, it's a, a different fluid, uh, makes you introspective or moody, and then too much blood is uh, people who are charming or extroverted. And you see this all throughout literature, throughout history. The ancient Greeks would use this system in their plays, a character would be identified as choleric, and they would act that way, or a character was identified as having too much blood, and they were the extrovert and so forth. Um, even in Shakespeare's time, this was, was being used and recognized. And I made this really serendipitous discovery when I was taking the characters that I had written as this short story or as a novella, um, I realized, and I, I'm not making this up, that I had written the four Huberts into these characters, that Adam is the, the workaholic, that Eve is the nostalgic one, the depressive one. Cain is introspective and moody. He's the one writing this journal. He's the one who retreats to his thoughts as a way of groping, uh, groping, gripping with the, uh, the, the situation he's in. And Abel, the younger brother, is the charming one. He 
kind of is the, the button pusher in the family. He also plays up that he's the child, the baby, and uses that to his advantage with his parents. And this connection, when I landed on that, I realized that this is what I was going to use as a key part of the puzzles. Uh, Lucian had asked me last night if I was going to be giving away any, how many spoilers am I giving? This is the big spoiler. Um, but it, it, it doesn't take that long before you start to hit this. So yeah. just don't write this down, you'll be okay. <laughs> Um, but but I, it was really it was really remarkable, and it sort of told me I was on the right track. You know, when, when these kind of things line up, I thought, okay, I'm 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 doing something right here. And so, understanding these um, understanding this connection plays directly into the game, where when you have to learn these mixtures, you're not always told flat flat out like mix act uh, ash with sulfur and blood, for example. It would be things like mix ash and sulfur and Abel's uh, humor. And so the player needs to discover what humor ties to the, the family member. Um, and they can do that both through other clues, I won't go into all of them, um, as well as just reading the text. I was really hoping that people would be able to consult. A, you're given an in-game book which describes humors as well as a lot of the other system that between the book and reading some of the, the text about the family and put it together, oh, okay, Abel is sanguine. Um, but what I really appreciated was that by moving this story to interactive fiction, I was now engaging with the characters in a way that I hadn't engaged with them before. And I think that's also a really positive thing. Um, And then it helped me to find the emotional core of the story, the Mark of Cain, which is also a question I would not have asked myself if I had been sticking with the traditional, the traditional narrative. So to get down into the weeds a little bit, though, the alchemy uh, system, I, I would love to tell you that when I designed this game, and it was all pre-planned out, and I had it all mapped out, and I knew all the questions, I knew all the problems I was going to face, and it's nothing like that. It was the exact opposite. I kept, I kept running into these various problems. And these questions in particular kept coming back to me. And I would answer the questions one way, and then I would go back, and, and I, or I, I'd write the code. And then about a month later, I'd go, no, 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 I'm going to do this differently. And I'd have to rip out all that code and code it differently. And then I'd say, well, wait, no, I didn't think about this. And I, it, was, it, was, it was pretty painful. Easily the, the most difficult coding problem in this game was this whole alchemy system. Um, being able to, you ultimately have 16 different substances in your toolkit and being able to handle all the different ways that players could uh, smear this substances onto any surface in the game and uh, be expected to get some kind of result. So just to go through the questions real quick, um, the questions were things like, do you have an unlimited amount of each substance, or do you have a limited amount? In which case, if you run out, um, are, are you are you host? Is the game over? Uh, can you retrieve more of that substance? Which plays in the next question. Uh, some of these some of these substances come from sources you discover. So can you go back and get more from that source? But not all of them do. So you're you're given a limited number at the beginning, and then you find more later. And then the other problem I faced was was can the player hack this system? by repeatedly trying different combinations. Um, it, I, I was, I'm hoping players don't do that. I'm hoping players are a little bit more uh, thoughtful about how they approach a game, but you know, I could see someone trying to, to, trying to get through the game that way. And then finally, one of the questions was, can they really carry all 16 of these substances at once? Do I want to impose inventory limitations and such? And like I said, all of these questions I played with and I recoded and coded and coded. And I came, I came to an interesting realization is that all these questions, even though they're kind of technical and down in the weeds, what I was really asking myself was what kind of a game did I want to write? Like what, what, what was I hoping that the player was going to experience? And I'm, I'm going to offer a sort of a, a binary opposition. It's incomplete. Yeah, and I don't want to say that all texts fall into this, into this spectrum, 
But I began to think of story as experience versus story as a challenge. And to use more traditional texts as, as examples, I began to think of like books. Um, this was made into a Netflix series recently, but the book is excellent. The Queen's Gambit by Walter Tevis, uh, or Rebecca, which is a gothic book of suspense by uh, uh, Dave Maurier. Um, very, very, very sensuous and creepy sort of way, that, the book. And whereas you have, in traditional fiction, you might view like Nabokov's Pale Fire or David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest as a challenging kind of story where you're, you, you as the reader are, are forced to confront puzzles and traps and such. Um, and I don't want to say that any story is one or the other. It's most definitely a spectrum. And I don't want to say, for example, that books like Queen's Gambit or Rebecca are not challenging. They are challenging. But it's a different kind of challenge. Um, and I felt that I was somewhat in a similar kind of, of spectrum. And ultimately, I decided that I was more interested in the former than the latter. I didn't want to create a, like this insidious puzzle game. I really wanted to create a game where you were experiencing this world and seeing this family drama, which is how I viewed the Adam and Eve and Abel and Cain story as a family drama up close. And so once I, once I kind of answered this question, all of those questions I just talked about all kind of just snapped into focus. And I really, once I figured this out, I, I didn't go back. I was good with my decisions. So basically, I said, once you find these essences, these, these basic substances, you're good. You don't, you don't run out. Um, matter of fact, the code still has, <laughs> it actually has a counter inside. And it has all the, the, the code is still in the, in the game where if you run out, it tells you you're done. But there's just a simple line of code that says, if this, if this hits zero, make it one and keep going, you know? I didn't want to, it was too late in the process for me to, to rip all that back out. Um, I did in institute a cooldown between attempts to, to sort of discourage hacking, and that's exactly what it is. It's sort of, it fails, and if they try it a couple times as a message to be effective, maybe you should look around some more and, and come back to this later, you know? Rather than just, I don't want to punish players, I just was like, yeah, this, this isn't really working, maybe you should, you should move on and come back. Um, I decided I did not want to do any inventory management puzzles. I just was not interested in that at all. And then I even integrated a, a tutorial in the opening locations, just so when the player is playing, they pretty quickly come to grips with the mechanics of this alchemy system. Um, yeah. Quick question. This is before you showed it to anyone else? Was um, like, it just you looking, thinking about the game? or? I believe this was before the beta. Yeah, I did yeah. some early beta tests, but I believe that, yeah. So the question was, um, did I make these decisions before I had showed it to anyone else? And I believe so. Uh, I'm almost positive, in fact. Yeah. Um, I'm just a little worried about time here, so I'm going to um, kind of go through this pretty quickly. So like I said, this is a parser game. It's text adventure. It's primarily text-based. But I did want to add some polish, and TADS has faculties for adding still graphics and sound to a game. They're, it's pretty crude, but it's available, and I thought I would try to take advantage of it, again, for polish reasons. Um, so I mentioned the research I had done. Um, while I was doing the research, I had stumbled on the Hudson River School. This was a, a group of 19th century landscape painters uh, they were based in the United States, but they were not all Americans. I, I don't even, I don't really know, if I know enough about the school to know that they knew each other. Um, the time frame is actually fairly extended, uh, as early as the 18-teens or 1820s, all the way to the 1850s, I think. So it, it may just be that later critics sort of put this label onto a whole group of painters. Um, but what was really interesting was, as I discovered that these painters had been painting the American West as Eden reclaimed, that there was this, all this land that was apparently untouched by human hand. And they adapted, they were painting these landscapes, and they often gave these landscapes religious undertones. 
Um, and, and sometimes not even undertones, just overt religious themes using the American West as the backdrop. And they were essentially describing what's sometimes called the post-Lapsarian anti-Diluvian world, which to, to translate that, post-Lapsarian means after the fall, that's after Adam and Eve were kicked out of Eden. And anti-Diluvian means before the deluge, that's before Noah's Ark and the Great Flood. And there was this popular vision in the 19th century. Again, this is before science came along and said, you know, let's maybe we can be a little more methodical about this. Uh, but there was this view of the world that the, the young earth was very, <clears throat> excuse me, geologically active, um, covered, sort of shrouded in a mist, very jungly, um, and that it was a different time, uh, both, both literally and figuratively. So I, I'll just show some examples real quick. This is the Sierra Nevadas by Albert. I'm going to, I think it's Bearstadt. Uh, as you can see, it's 1868. Um, I, I hope that's coming out well enough. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, it's just these just gorgeous, lush paintings um, uh, of, of, of California and other parts of the American West. Um, here's his uh, a painting he did of Yosemite. Um, and you can easily see how someone who believed that the Bible was the recorded history of mankind could see this, these landscapes and think, this is what the world was once like before mankind showed up and started building buildings and industry and farming and such. Um, and then Thomas Cole was a very prominent artist in this movement. Um, this is overtly... Christian or Judeo-Christian. This is the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. Um, it's believed that these are two different landscapes that he sort of squashed together as sort of a before-after picture from the American West. And if you look closely on the left side, sort of left center, you'll see two figures moving away, and that's Adam and Eve. And I, when I was writing these as a, as a, as a short story, and then as I was working on the game, this, these were the visuals that I would look at and say, this is what, I, when I'm describing the world of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, these are the images I want to, to, to write about. And so to add some polish to the game, I, I didn't want to just dump these landscapes into the middle of the text. But what I wound up doing was, is taking strips, horizontal, horizontal and vertical strips, I, would, I created a left-hand uh, column, uh, like a margin, that would change. The image would change as you enter different regions of the game. And then the game is broken up into four chapters. And at the beginning of each chapter, I included a horizontal slice. I don't claim, I'm not an illustrator. I'm not a graphic artist. This is me. Uh, it's me with some public domain images in GIMP and, and, and it, making it work as best I can. But um, it, that's where these came from. And, uh, I'll, you know, I'll let you judge how well it worked, but I, it worked for me. I, I felt good about it. I felt that, like I said, it's more about adding a little polish to the game and not so much about defining what the game is. And most importantly, um, this game can be played on interpreters that don't support graphics or sound. So none of these images are required to play the game. It's, it's purely decorative. Um, the music was actually a, a bigger challenge, um, and uh, one I had to throw myself into was a little more um, both technical and putting on a creative hat. Um, if I had a big bucket of money, um, this is the soundtrack I would have used, or, or something similar. I would have hired a bunch of musicians to make something. Um, I was inspired by Peter Gabriel's soundtrack, Passion, which is the soundtrack to The Last Temptation of Christ, a movie that came out in the late 80s. Peter Gabriel uh, assembled a group of Middle Eastern and North African musicians. Some of them were using musical instruments that were period appropriate for the time of Christ. And it's a beautiful soundtrack. Um, I still listen to it all the time. Um, and it's great for writing. It's great for just kind of when you want to get away from things. Um, if I could have used this, I would have. Um, but 
I couldn't, so, but I wanted to attempt to make something similar to it. Um, so, uh, actually, I think I have these slides out of order. This is not quite. Um, so what I did was, is I turned to the free music archives that are on the internet. These are, this is music that's available through the Creative Commons, largely. Um, and it, when I say crash the stacks, that's exactly what I mean. It's like going to a record store back in the day and going through the vinyl stacks, trying to find the, the, some album that you've never heard of before, some artist that you're interested in. And that's what I had to do was, there's so much, um, of mu so much music in these archives. Uh, and it was a pleasure for me. I had no problem doing that. Um, but it did take some time, but I was able to find about eight or 10 tracks that I felt gave uh, the kind of uh, background music that I was looking for, for, uh, for my game. And I just had to, when I say, listen, 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 I actually put those songs, when I finally came down to sort of my short list, I created a, excuse me, I created a playlist on my phone and every day when I went to take a walk, I would just listen to it on repeat. And that, what that allowed me to do was to make sure that I was really comfortable with that music and that there was nothing in it that I felt was sort of disruptive or, you know, sometimes, sometimes you listen to the first 20 seconds of the song, like, this is great. And then all of a sudden, like a distorted guitar comes in and I go, well, that's not what I'm looking for here. And I have to kick it out. And the only way you're going to do that is by listening to that music again and again. And that's what I did. Um, I still listen to it sometimes when I take a walk. Uh, and then I've got on the slide just four, uh, there's more than this, but these are four websites that offer free music um, to download. Um, some of it is also sound effects, which I did not use for the game, but you could do that as well. Um, the only thing I would add is make sure you respect the artist's license. It's their music and um, give credit where credit is due you know, in, in the final output. Um, and so how did I use, this is what I wanted to get to, I was getting to it earlier. How did I use the music in the game? Um, the problem with is that TADS has a pretty, like I said, unsophisticated music playing system. And one thing it doesn't have is a way for the code to receive an event that says the song is finished playing. Um, so because of that, uh, there, was a, there was an option that I could have looked into with TADS for using what's called a real-time timer. But it turns out there was, a, I won't go into the detail, but it's sort of an aesthetic ugliness that comes with the, the real-time timer. And I didn't want to sort of push that into the game. So I decided to think about music in terms of turns, not time. So a turn is a natural clock of parser-based fiction. You, you type in an action, that's one turn. You type in another action, that's another turn. So what I did was is I created several playlists that were prioritized and event-driven, but not event-driven in terms of time, but in terms of actions within the, the game. So in any region that you're in, in the game, there's this low priority playlist of like three songs that are playing on a loop. And that just keeps playing while you're in that region. Um, but if the player solves a puzzle, that fires an event, that this puzzle's been solved. And for that, I would then play upbeat music or whatever, something appropriate to sort of give that musical feedback to the player that, yeah, you've done something right, good job. Uh, and, but, I really, but that might only play for five or 10 turns. And then that uh, event, that playlist would turn off and it would go back to that low priority playlist where it was playing the regional, the region music continuously. And then if they discover a new clue, some mysterious or intriguing music come on for five turns. Again, using music as a feedback loop. Um, and then once that, those tur that turn count has passed, fall back down to the low priority playlist. And then when the player enters a new region, um, I would change the, the baseline playlist and just, again, just use the same strategy. It's really simple. Um, it just took me a long time to figure it out. And once it, I, I was really happy with the end result. I, I, it's, that was sort of, that also told me maybe I was on the right track, is that it was simple, and, and, but I was getting the results that I wanted. Um, one key thing here is that uh, I made sure that the music was optional, I, and I got that from some of my data testers as well as reviewers. Like, I really don't want to listen to your music while I'm playing your game. I was like, that's cool, you can turn it off. So, 
So I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, do you have? Were you able to fade out the last thing before you turned yeah, the next it, one? Or yeah. Yeah. Sort of no. If I couldn't do a fade out, I, would, I just would have done, not done yeah. the music because okay. you had to get this really jarring. Yeah, switches. No, it's sophisticated enough that you could do fade ins and fade outs, and uh, it yeah, it sounds pretty. It sounds pretty good. Considering all things considered. Um, the other problem was is that when I was mentioning some of these music sources, is I was also looking for traditional music. Some of the music that I did land on was written by modern music uh, musicians, um, largely one person acts who were, you know, got access to computer and keyboards and such and make their own music in their, their bedroom, probably. But um, I was looking at traditional music online. I worked in an archive. We have all this music from all over the world. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of that music was that we have archived is really grainy with a lot of uh, pops and clicks. And I, that was really difficult to add to the game. I think people in the modern era were so used to digital, digital sound, I, I didn't feel comfortable doing that. So I think for a different kind of game that might have worked. Um, but I wasn't, um, I, I wanted to go a different direction. So. Okay, so as I mentioned, I coded this in TADS. TADS is a pretty venerable system. Um, it was uh, first written by Mike Roberts in the 1980s, actually. Um, my understanding, I could be wrong, is Zerf here because he might know and or complain about what I want to say. <laughs> Oh, I believe TADS was before Inform. It wasn't before the Z machine, but it was before Inform. Uh, we went through a number of iterations. It was TADS 2, which was popular in the 90s. And at the beginning of the 2000s, Mike Roberts released TADS 3. Um, the perpetual song about TADS 3 is that TADS is dead. And I'm here to tell you it's not dead, but it's just it's sort of in a low summer. Um, but I got three notes about it, which is A, TADS is alive and well. In fact, in the interactive fiction top, I think uh, Jim Aiken, Aiken came in 10th or 8th with another TADS game. So there were two get TADS game in the top 10 in the last IF top. So someone, people are still using it. It's still a system that's worth looking at. Um, it's a small but fervent community. We're on the interactive fiction board, um, in fiction.org, I believe. And um, yeah, give, if you're interested in writing a parser game, give TADS a shot. It rocks. It's a, it's a fully developed system with not just one, but two libraries to choose from for as your base world building and NBC conversation, all, vehicles, all the things you'd want. Um, the only asterisk I would put on number three is it really does help if you already know symbolic programming. It's, it's a lot like JavaScript or Java. Um, it's not a rules based like uh, in Form 7. Uh, it, you don't, I don't want to discourage anyone if you want to jump in, but it is just one more hurdle if you've never written software before. And just really quickly, I just want to give some credits as to everyone that contributed to According to Kane. As I mentioned, TADS is written by Mike Roberts. Uh, the library that I used is an alternate library called ADV3 Lite, and it's written by Eric Eve. Uh, these are my beta testers. Uh, my beta testers rocked. They found, uh, they, they gave me so many great ideas, great inspiration. They also found so many bugs, um, and I really couldn't have, it would not have been the product, the final result without them. And then the music uh, was from Kevin McLeod and Sergey Quadrado. Uh, as a quick note, I would play some of the music today, um, but unfortunately, um, some of the music, there's some language on the license about not putting the music on YouTube, and I know that this is going to be on YouTube at some point. So if you want to hear the music, um, just come by later, and I'll play some for you to give an idea of what it sounded like. Um, or play the game. Yeah, or play the game. Yeah, just I'll put that plug in. And that's it. Um, thank you for listening. I really appreciate you coming up and giving your time. And then, yeah, I can answer questions now if you like. From all five of you. <laughs> Ask all my questions. Did you ask all your questions? Yeah. yeah. So there's the four family members, but is, is the mythical god a character in the game? Well? That's a, also, I'll repeat it. Yeah, it's, the question is is the mythical god? And no, god, I mean, I took like a, a 
I told myself, that, I mean, I explicitly told myself I was going to take a deist perspective that there is a creator in this game and he's called the creator and never called, I never used the word God. Um, and that he is a, uh, the, you know, the deist perspective that there was a creator who started the universe or set it into motion and then took his hands off the wheel and just let humankind run. And that's really how the game present, is presented. However, um, and I was asked this question by someone else who was here yesterday, so I'll, I'll just bring it up. There is a, a, a character, a crow, that follows you throughout the game, and the crow just observes you. You, you never really have any interaction with the crow. And um, this was both, both inspired by the Quran, where the crow teaches uh, Cain how to bury Abel, and then also, I, my vision was that the crow um, was like an agent of the creator. Who This is how the creator kept tabs on what was going on without actually interfering. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, given that you've written a, a lot of, as you said, traditional fiction before Virginia's, what were some of the, um, like the, the narrative problem solving kind of apparatus in your? Brain, some of the elements that you counteract to really um, build this as a very pleasing interactive experience. So, so the question is: is how, what problems did I have to solve, or how did I deal with taking a traditional story written in as like a serial fashion into an interactive game? Right? Yeah. So that 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 I, I the prop, I was fighting it is what it was. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to. I wanted the player to read the story in my way, and I kind of, again, had to sort of just take like a moment of sand where I was like, you know what? That's not. That's not how this works. I have to accept that players are going to discover this world in their own pace at their own um, order. Um, it helped that the original story, as I mentioned, was sort of like scraps told out of order, um, and that there was never really a beginning or a middle or an end. And so a lot of that original text wound up in the game. Not all, not all of it. Um, it's actually I had to um, I had to cut quite a bit out. But it helped that the original story was written with the perspective that the reader would piece together what had happened afterward. And that I, I don't know that I could have taken like for example some of my other books. The narration is pretty tightly wound around a, a certain sequence of events. And I don't know that those would translate well into at least a, a, a parser-based game where you know the freedom of mobility is a big part of the parser um, aesthetic, I guess. You know? um, so yeah, to, to answer it in a short way, I fought it until I just quit fighting it. <laughs> yeah. And, and if you want to ask me any questions afterwards, I'm totally fine to talk to. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Appreciate it.